This is the fourth video in our problem solving decision making series for the School of Business at Washburn University. And in this series we're, we're discussing the PROACT model which is a systematic model used to make decisions and to solve problems. In the previous videos we've looked at defining the problem and we've looked at determining what the objectives are. In this video we're going to walk through how to determine what alternatives are and how to explore alternatives for solving your problems and meeting your objectives. So generating alternatives. Alternatives are the options that you can choose between in order to best meet your objectives and to solve the problem. Be creative when generating alternatives. You can't choose an alternative that you don't consider. So uh, whenever I ask students and other people to look at problem solving and to try to come up with some alternatives, I ask them to be creative, maybe not too creative, but to maybe work outside the box a little bit to, because sometimes they come up with new avenues and, and, and new ideas that otherwise they wouldn't have considered. There are several common pitfalls in generating alternatives that you would want to avoid. So the first one is business as usual. So let's say that it's time for you uh, to buy a new car. Your, your car is falling apart and you, uh, you need to find something new to drive. You might do what you've always done. You might have always bought a brand new car, uh, maybe a certain model, maybe a certain brand, and, and just keep doing that over and over again. Or maybe you always buy a, a used car that's just a couple years old. So a common pitfall would be that, that business as usual just to do the same thing that you've always done. Incrementalizing is, is related to business as usual because what this means is that you find alternatives to what you've done in the past but they're just marginally different there there's not a big difference in what you what you're proposing and what you've done in the past and we want to think beyond that the default alternative is an alternative in place that you just fall back to if no other alternatives emerge so for example let's say you finish getting your degree in business and specifically let's say you get a degree in marketing and you go out and you try to find a marketing job and your default though so if you can't find a marketing job let's say in Kansas City or Chicago or someplace you want to live your default is to go back and work on the family farm well oftentimes what happens is that people will not search for that job or search for that new alternative as vigorously as if they didn't have that default alternative in place so Imagine that you don't have that default alternative when you go out to, to come up with ideas on how to solve a problem such as uh, finding a job or finding a place to live and finding a job. Another common pitfall is the per first possible solution. So let's say that you need a plumber. Uh, you've got some, some work that needs to be done in your house and you need a plumber and so you go out to Facebook or, or another social networking site and you ask people, hey, who's a good plumber? And a friend of yours gets on there and says, I, I like these plumbers here. They're, uh, they're, they're great plumbers. You should go with them. Well, that would be your first possible solution. And just taking that first possible solution is a common pitfall. Uh, what, it, what it might be wise to seek out other opinions and seek out other alternatives to the, what that first possible solution is. Another common pitfall is limiting your alternatives to those presented by others. We're going to address this a little bit more later. But what we don't want to do is just restrict ourselves to things that other people have said or other people have suggested. Sometimes we need to think on our own to come up with different alternatives. Another common pitfall is eliminating alternatives by waiting. So let's say you need to buy a used car and you go to the used car dealership and you see two cars that you would like but you're you're wavering between the two you don't know which one to get so if you wait long enough one of those alternatives is going to disappear because someone's going to come and buy one of them and so you're left without any alternatives and you have to go with just the the one choice that's left the next thing we need to consider is how to generate better alternatives so one way to do this is consider your objectives and ask how you can achieve them. Go from the ends, which are the objectives, to the means. So you might ask yourself, how can you decrease your cost of commuting? 
And then from there, we would start to look at our alternatives and judge which one would best meet that objective. You should challenge your constraints. So constraints are things that they're, they're kind of the, the walls we build up that we, we feel like we have to work within. And in the problem statement that we talked about before, I encouraged you to write down your constraints, the constraints that you have uh, when you go to solve a problem. And you need to analyze and determine whether those constraints are real or they're assumed. So for example, a real constraint could be that you have a kind of a short garage and you're looking for a car. Uh, the car you want is 18 feet long and your garage is only 17 feet long. That's a real constraint. If you want to park that car in your garage, you're either going to have to shorten the car, which, which may decrease its value a little bit, or you may, do, may need to make your garage longer. And it could just be a thing where you can't get around that constraint and you need to find a different alternative. On the other hand, you may have some assumed constraints. So constraints that aren't, aren't real, but you, you feel like it's something to be followed. So it could be um, an unwritten policy where you work. You, you might work someplace that it's kind of unwritten that everyone's there 8 a.m. to 5 p.m. and you're considering some alternatives, uh, some ideas that might put you there later in the day to solve a problem, but also have you leave later at night. And you might just eliminate that alternative based on your assumed constraint before going and talking to the people you work with to see if it's something that would work out for you. And then, then finally, you should do your own thinking first. So before you go and ask someone else for their opinion or you start looking around the internet for different, different alternatives, sit down, take some time uh, in, a, in a quiet place and, and think about some alternatives that you could use to meet your objectives. So some other ways to generate better alternatives. First of all, learn from experience. If you're going to do some remodeling in your house and you want some ideas on how to do that, go look at, uh, at houses that are currently on the market that have been recently remodeled. If you are looking for, let's say, a, a better way to landscape your yard, drive around the area and, and look at yards that you think look good in order to learn from what they've done in the past. Secondly, now's a good time to ask other people for their suggestions as well. Learn from what they've done and, and ask them what they're, how they would go about solving the problem that you're looking at. Then finally, and, and this is actually really important and something a lot of people miss, is give your subconscious time to operate. My wife and I were at, at someone else's house, a friend's house, uh, a few days ago and we were eating dinner and then we were playing a game afterwards and this, is, this actual item came up because my wife started making fun of me and saying that I take about 30 days to make a decision. I, you know, I corrected her and said, no, it's about, you know, it's about three days. But really, this is something I find that's very useful where you give your, your mind time to go through your alternatives, to, to look at weaknesses and consider other things that you can do in order to solve your problems. The next step is to tailor your alternatives to your problem. One thing that you can do is consider process alternatives. So, for example, you change the decision-making process to be objective rather than subjective. The Smart Choices book that I mentioned in the first video in this series gives the example of having to choose who to give tickets to between two friends of yours. So, in this scenario, you've been given this ticket to go see this show that the person giving it to you knew that you couldn't go to, but knows that you have some friends that might be interested. You only have one ticket and two friends that, that are interested. So how can you solve this dilemma of who to give the ticket to? And one way to solve it is just by flipping a coin. So you've changed the process of the decision making um, to, to something where you can solve the problem and meet your objectives, which in this case would be not make your friends angry. And, and, and really the, the way in which you're solving your problem is by changing the process by which you choose your alternative. Another way is, is to look at win-win alternatives. So sometimes 
you have a problem before you or you have a decision you have to make, but it's really not your decision in the end. Maybe it's a supervisor's decision. Maybe it's your spouse's decision or you need to include someone else in that in that decision. And so in this case, it's good to come up with win-win alternatives so you can get them something that they want in solving the problem along with something that you want. Another way to generate alternatives is to look at different ways at information gathering. So maybe in the past you've tried to determine where you want to live by looking in the newspaper or finding a real estate agent, but nowadays you can go online um, and seek out alternatives online. Maybe you just go and, and talk with people in the community uh, where you're looking to move to see what they would suggest as well. And finally, uh, you can buy time and use that as an alternative in order to give yourself more time to, to consider the different alternatives you have before you. So I've got here an example of finding a place to live. And in this example, I'm going to give you, I made a bad decision and taking time to make a better decision would have benefited me and, and my family greatly. When I took my first job in academia, I moved from Arkansas to Wisconsin. I had never been to Wisconsin before in my life. Um, I found out some different things about living there uh, that I wasn't, I wasn't quite ready for. Uh, my son has a lot of pet allergies, uh, fairly severely allergic to, to pets, and what his doctor had told us was that we couldn't move into a house that had had a pet in it for at least six months. So if someone moving out and they have a pet, would not have been an option for us. My wife did something really brave when I went to look for a house. She told me just to go on my own. We had two um, small children at home and so taking us all up there for about five days to look for a house wouldn't have been a very good idea. And so I went up there and I, and I went to the real estate agent and I told them I can't have a house that's had a pet in it. Now if you're not from Wisconsin, uh, one thing that that kind of caught me off guard is that if you have a pet, it's an indoor pet. Um, it gets very cold there and in the winter your pet would become a pet sickle uh, if left outside. So we essentially just had to find a house where the owners hadn't had pets and, and that was really the biggest challenge. So I went up there, my alternatives were severely limited because I had to find a, a house that was available at that time so we could go ahead and make a bid on it. So we ended up, I ended up finding a house. Um, in the end, it wasn't a very good house. It was a very old house. It needed a lot of work. Um, there was a lot of surprising things that the previous owners had done to it that I had to undo and, and to fix. And it wasn't really in the, in the part of town that we would have preferred to live in. So in this case, a time buying alternative would have just been to, to lease a house or, or lease a, um, an apartment for a little while after we were able to move there and spend some time getting to know the community a little bit before buying a house. Finally, you need to know when to quit looking. At some point you have to stop looking at alternatives and, and trying to find new alternatives and make a decision. So one question you can ask yourself is, would you be satisfied with one of your existing alternatives? If you are satisfied with one of your existing alternatives, maybe that's a good time to stop looking. Do you have a range of alternatives? Are there distinct differences among the different alternatives? So if you just have, let's say three alternatives, but they're all pretty much the same. So for example, like three new cars, the only difference between them is the color of the car. Maybe you should look a little bit longer and consider other alternatives. And then finally, would time spent on other decisions or activities be more productive? If that's the case, maybe it's time to move on and just make the decision. It's important to mention that a perfect solution seldom exists. So spending more and more time trying to find a perfect solution is somewhat wasteful. And this ends this video on the topic of generating alternatives. We're going to put it all together in the, ne in the next video, which uh, is, is on consequences. And in that video, we're going to consider multiple al alternatives.